concepts. And, uh, and many concepts in many fields, which both thinkers have been dealing with and writing about. Uh, the power of multiplicities, the groupuscule, he said at some point, the extent of the subjects, the invention of new theories, of new concepts, uh, exploitation, subordination, networks, desire, subversion. It's opening up to many, many discourses. Um, and indeed, we could have, we could weave through them here. Um, but maybe our discussion for this first uh, quiver is to set also some grounds uh, to, to also see what this is and uh, with your help and with your input. Um, and there is no better motive, there's no better way to do this uh, to our opinion than a, than a text about intellectuals and power. Um, so what we see in this text right from the beginning um, in a historical to present Foucauldian line uh, is that intellectuals were traditionally uh, the product of two different aspects. Uh, firstly, it was their position in bourgeois society, inside capitalism, uh, with their poverty, exploitation, rejection, um, perse persecution, uh, the accusations of subver subversive activity, immorality, and so on and so forth. And secondly, it was the role in revealing truth. Uh, even uh, as Foucault says, political relationships where they were unsuspected. And um, later, uh, Foucault says that intellectuals were rejected and persecuted when the facts became incontrovertible. After May 68, intellectuals discovered that the masses no longer need them to gain knowledge. And he continues, uh, that the masses uh, know at the time when the discussion was uh, um, happened. They know the masses perfectly well, far better than the intellectual, and they are certainly capable of expressing themselves. To build upon this 50 years old text, uh, the recent upheavals that he mentions but are no longer recent, or the, the current situation, um, make the intellectual even more useless in that sense. Precisely because uh, quite often uh, they don't manage to, to follow any line of light. Not always, of course, but very often. And because today, more than ever, the masses, as he says, the people, uh, no longer need the intellectual to gain knowledge. Uh, knowledge is everywhere today. We all know this. Information is everywhere. News, fake news opinions of all kinds, audio, photo, video, edited or not edited, or timestamped or not, um, social media, of course, conspiracy theories that pass as facts. And people know, and we know, or at least we think we know perfectly well, without illusion. And it doesn't matter also anymore if this is true. Truth doesn't matter anymore. We tend to follow, read, and believe in whatever already agrees with us. Uh, we form an opinion and uh, we search what agrees with this opinion. And we are constantly fed with this opinion in social media algorithms as well. And um, if we share or if we post or if we comment on an information that is fake, most people's reaction to that indication, to the indication that this information is fake news, is, well, okay, it could be true. So it doesn't matter anymore what it is true. And this is for today's condition what Foucault calls, to my opinion, incontrovertible fact for other circumstances in other contexts, of course, but yet valid for today in a very relevant way. Um, so the questions, uh, the issues that uh, arise are that intellectuals are useless, let's say. Uh, I say it a bit <laughs> radically, but... Um, also, there is in the text uh, a direct suggestion that theory must be useful. Theory must function in the piercing of, of walls and service in a practical way. And both, both thinkers are very unconditional um, as far as this is concerned. Uh, Foucault says that in this sense, theory does not express, translate, or serve to apply practice. It is practice. And Deleuze responds that it must be useful, it must function, and not for itself. If no one uses it, then the theory is worthless or the moment is inappropriate. Um, it should be, as he says, an investment for combat. 
Um, so here is the issue or the questions and how, how does theory manages to, to see the wall, to pierce the wall and to cross the line? At what uh, assemblages or what kind of alliance could be formed? And what is this new relationship between theory and practice? And what could be the common line of flight of the weapon and the tool? Uh, maybe Andrew, if you agree, we could uh, also visit the text and um, maybe we could um, read. Um... Yeah, um, I had prepared to do a close reading of a section, but maybe do you want to do that first or do you want to open up into just a broader discussion to hear what everyone else was sort of pulling out of the text and relating to those sort of provo beautiful provocations that you open up? You know, I love the sort of uh, path that you give about there being a wall that the point of theory is not just to let's say see or apprehend the wall but to be able to strategize find positions combat the wall and actually pierce it and get us through to the other side um it is so, about the text whatever you, okay. whatever you prefer whatever other um, um if there is somebody that wants to to speak of course we are Let's let's open to the group for a moment. Um, maybe use the hand raising just because we have so many people. Um, and mine either one of those two lines that you presented, the one of the the theory practice dimension, or the other one being um, uh, the provocation of the uselessness of intellectuals today in this alternative model being presented. I know it could be a little intimidating to present in front of such a large group of people, but maybe there's some veterans or some uh, courageous speakers who'd like to jump off. Oh, great. Harris, why, why don't you begin? Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Donald. Um, as for the intellectuals being useless point, I think it's really interesting to think of this in terms of Foucault's work as per the specific intellectual and the universal intellectual. Um, and if we see this within this history, of course, the term is originally derived from Sartre um, in a piece uh, even before Foucault. But I think if we consider this as an attack in the, uh, toward the universal intellectual um, who stands forth and purports to speak in the name of all of humanity, to provide voice and consciousness for those seen as not having these on their own or not having any relation to knowledge, um, I think it's an attack towards that figure and especially towards that figure as it existed at the time within France and especially within Marxist circles, within the Communist Party, et cetera. And um, I wouldn't go as far as saying that uh, intellectuals are useless or what I got from the text is another conception of the intellectual, the specific intellectual who sees situated struggles always after these struggles have become, who does not purport to be the conscience of people, but after seeing a struggle which has already erupted on the ground, th this type of intellectual would go in and provide just help, not direction, not moralizing, you know, you should do this or you should do that, but just certain, and therefore the toolbox, certain things which can be taken up and then will prove useful. So even the fact that we're now, you know, we're talking and we're talking about lines of flight, it's exactly this kind of, uh, of use of tools or if struggles on the ground started using these things or with Foucault, you know, discipline. It, it can lead to struggles with prisoners or workers completely transforming the way they will encounter their own problems. So I think that's an important distinction. Thank you so much, Harris. Uh, Gustavo, I think you're next. Uh, uh, thank you uh, very much. I think I, I had, uh, I guess, uh, uh, a clarification from, from Dana. I guess she brought up um, an interesting point about what we see now. And I, I equate uh, kind of this new theoretical you know, theory and practice now to kind of a science. Like what are, what do we actually see? And the way that I kind of thought about the, the first reading was there's different types of problems. There's a complicated problem. Uh, and this is based on complexity theory by John Holland. And he defines uh, two kind of terms. Uh, complicated is a problem that we can all solve by brute force. 
we have the tools already and we know how it works. A complex problem is something of imagination. We have to invent. And it seems as though that in, in this theory, there is an invention, there is an experiment in place and we are observing the practice. But then at some point, I think within practice, there are questions that uh, in real time happen. So it changes the initial theory. So there's kind of two trajectories going at the same time. And my question to Dana is uh, very simply, when you talked about the idea of currency now in our environment, especially with, I guess, AI and in interpretation of different communities, can you, can you elaborate a little bit more specifically on what, what are those tools doing to theory? Like, are we seeing the same things? Obviously we're not, but I just wanted to get your take a little bit. I don't believe that we're seeing the same thing. I don't believe that we could be seeing the same thing in any situation. And it doesn't all, it doesn't have to, 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 in my opinion, it doesn't have to do with uh, what are the technological conditions or what are the, um, it is impossible to see the same thing. This is, this is uh, for sure. If this is what you're asking me, Gustavo, and thank you for your uh, question. Um, and also, um, who's, uh, who was speaking before? Harris, yes, Harris, sorry, there was um, a line in front of your name. Uh, and thank you also for your comment. Um, yes, of course, they don't speak for the, yes, of course, I don't mean that intellectuals are useless. Uh, it was a bit of a radical, um, you know, uh, phrase um, also to, to provoke maybe in some way. But it is true that they speak in the text about the, the difference of the theory and the practice and how it should function. And though I don't believe that it, theory is useless, it, it, it should have, it, it should emerge from practice or probably go back to it in, in some ways. And yes, your, your comment was um, very, very interesting. So I put this in the chat, but I wanted to announce just like as a process issue, I think most people, or at least most interfaces that people have, you can see the raised hand order. And if you don't see it automatically, you can see it by um, opening up your participants window and then it'll sort of show up in order. So in these discussion periods, I'd love it if people want to even self-organize, you know, when you see that you're, up next and the other person seems to have completed just keep keep sort of rolling things along because zoom can make conversations like this feel a little tedious especially if they have to be overly facilitated so what i'm seeing right now is josh then daniel then ven and it would be great if we could just sort of build those out of the conversation have some other people join and you know maybe call it in like 10 minutes or 15 minutes you know depending on how, how much um enthusiasm we're having so i'll, I'll hand it off uh, first off, thanks a lot, obviously, Andrew and, and Dana. And Dana, I'll, I'll take your provocation a bit. Um, I'm a completely uneducated autodidact uh, with very little use for intellectualism in general, aside from what I find useful as a, a tool and or a weapon. Um, pardon any noise, I have four children, two dogs running around right now. But um, what I find interesting with the piece and kind of how I got interested in Deleuze in the first place uh, was I'm a bit less of a social creature and a bit more of a, you know, almost a, a sternarian my, myself. And Deleuze, Deleuze leaves so much room open in that sense. And when I think about the kind of Foucauldian sort of intellectualism for intellectualism's sake, not necessarily, but a little bit more of that value inherent in it versus what can I take for myself and actually not pierce the wall in some sort of larger, larger, uh, metaphorical meaning, but in a very literal way, just knock the wall down that happens to be in front of me in my personal life and how I interact with the world. Uh, when you take it to that kind of radically subjective place, I, I think that it's much more easy for me and in myself to, I mean, my family of six is, we are a nomadic war machine in, in some ways in our relation to the broader society. Uh, and I think that once you peel away, you know, some of the intellectual language, 
those tools are right there in front of you. Uh, if you choose so to find them, pick them up and go and hurl them at someone uh, and turn them into weapons, I guess, in, in a very simple, simple sense. But again, thanks a lot for putting this on and super interesting conversation so far. Thank you, Josh. Um, so sort of to, to, to follow this vein, I, I want to think about triangulating this through maybe like uh, a, a third term of like opacity and to think through whether we can uh, picture, whether we can sort of explain a little bit of the context and the value of the intellectual and theoretical work in terms of opacity. So as someone who's like coming from a background where I do a lot of sex education work, right, I think, and this is especially an issue now because somatic approaches have become very popular. And the main idea behind somatic approaches to like body education is that the body is actually transparent to the self, right? And if you're attuned, then perhaps the body is transparent to the other, right? So there is no need for a kind of theorization. So how important is sort of arguing for a necessity of opacity towards realizing a need for what tools and weapons are and what is the value of intellectuals and in maybe um, being a, having that intellectual part process be a part be a process of identification of those tools and weapons within this like general context of opacity hi um uh just making sure my mic's working can everybody hear me okay awesome um yeah i i was thinking a lot um uh while people were talking about uh the part where uh, in the interview of intellectuals and in power where, where deleuze is saying um we don't revise a theory but construct new ones we have no choice but to make others and that to me uh along with the discussion uh elsewhere in, in here about the relay about sort of theory uh as a relay from from praxis to praxis point and praxis as a as a relay from theory to theory point that that speaks to me a lot um because it, it's kind of like in in um the introduction to archaeology of knowledge when Foucault is talking about how you know he had no choice but to keep innovating on himself in a way right he had no choice but to look at what he had written and grow you know and and you know change and continue to build on the theories that he'd already uh, done to the point where he contradicts himself and to the point where he's now having to say something new and it is from that sort of input of new information and you know, in particular, from the the uh, you know the influence of the the, the practice that he was doing, um, including as is mentioned in, in this interview, his work uh, with people in prisons and trying to make a, <clears throat> trying to make a space for their voices. Um, so I think I, I think that for me, when when it, we're talking about sort of the uh, an intellectual being useless, uh, it's in part an intellectual who lets uh, what they theorize calcify and become something kind of stagnant um, instead of, uh, you know, they can still, you know, produce more uh, articles, produce more books, but it'll be around a framework that they're trying to defend uh, more so than trying to interface with what is actually happening in the world and what is actually happening um, politically, especially to people who are marginalized and people who are oppressed. Uh, and then, you know, modifying their theory from there to the point where they might have to contradict themselves to the point where they might have to, uh, you know, do a complete reworking or extend themselves to a point where they realize some of their old errors. And I think that is what Deleuze is kind of gesturing towards here with we don't revise a theory but construct new ones, because it's not so much about you know, uh, building a body of work, you know, that's more the kind of intellectual that I think they're critiquing. It's, it's about continuing to engage with what is living and what is sort of vital um, in, in in political action. Um, and that's that's sort of what I had been thinking about while, while people were talking here. I think we're having such um, incredible contributions here because it's coming some from specific practice, some really great deep readings connecting to a lot of other work. Um, I didn't want to overburden our conversation at the beginning with putting too much historical constraint on it. 
uh, specifically because Thales himself seems to sees himself combating, trying to destroy, undo history, because it seems to weigh on us too much already. But, you know, I can't help but think that the uh, debate that we see in this between the universal and the specific intellectual and the, the particular stakes um, can be understood at least in part through history. So if we go back to the 19th century and let's say Marx, who's a sort of uh, important proximal reference point here, because you know, he's a German uh, intellectual who flees Germany. He has some education, but he doesn't work professionally as an intellectual. He sees himself as sort of writing things on the side as a journalist and informing and being parts of collective organizations, right? And the 19th century throughout at least Europe then was this incredibly repressive place where Marx, but also anarchists and other people on the left are routinely being imprisoned and being uh, kicked out of countries of their own origin simply for holding particular political beliefs. And so the stakes of that are, are, are quite curious or interesting because transgression is is so straightforward. The, the stakes are so specific. It can lead to uprisings and it's, it's, it's a powder keg in which things just like um, leap off the page. And even here in the United States where I'm coming to you from, this was happening quite extensively uh, throughout the end of the 19th century as well. You know, uh, maybe, you know, the uh, the Haymarket riots is, is a particular moment, but this goes all the way into the tens and the twenties where people are being incarcerated. So, you know, there, there's this notion of the leader who can sort of carry the masses through that, you know, the list has very little time for us and who hates the party and, and who, who really doesn't think that the intellectual stands ahead of other people. And so, you know, the unique kind of context of this dialogue is curious, though. Like Dana said, it, it comes out in 70, early 72, and they're talking about the imminent release of Anti-Oedipus, which hasn't come out yet. They had gone through the May 68 experience, which started with student uprisings is actually outside of Paris and then sort of take over with contagion and almost topple the whole country. And they're sort of start as this transitional figure who'd been very important before 68. And this sort of status after 68 is sort of an open question as this person who everyone looks to as a public intellectual and a sort of leader of the party and this man of conscience who will write, you know, major op-eds for newspapers and everyone stands up and listens and they'll sort of talk about it at the cafe afterward or something. And so Foucault and Deleuze are saying there's something else going on. And actually they're in this nascent formation with Sart of the prison information group. You know, they're agitating on behalf of prisons. They're publishing documents by prisoners. Their second issue was on George Jackson and the Black Panthers. So it's international. It's going to all kinds of scope. Their third issue, if I remember correctly, are the, um, the papers and the writings of a gay prisoner who had committed suicide. And so they're sort of promoting these sort of voices that they thought that, that hadn't been uh, uh, circulated in the same way. And they're saying, no, you know, we need to be joining these movements rather than leading these movements, right? But that's a very different circumstance than 2020. Maybe some people find themselves still in the 19th century, sure. Maybe some of you find yourself in a sort of post-68 moment right now. I don't think so. So I think the provocation still stands, like what is an intellectual today? Are they still you know, part of a party laying out the correct intellectual line? Probably not, though I suppose there's still a few people doing that. Are they just joining movements? And then are you even an intellectual at all if you've joined a movement? Why do we even keep the name intellectual? What's the actual work that you're doing that's different than making phone calls or knocking on doors or maybe more particularly making leaflets or something? Like, is there theory? Is there something we should call and retain theory in the practice of being part of anything from an insurrectionary, let's say a social democratic political formation? And what precisely does it look like today? I think that's exactly what's at stake. So if, if people have particular interests, I think this would this would go long. I also say, we just want to add one more layer before we sort of consider this, which is we have influencers now. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if public intellectuals were ever a thing in America. Maybe they were, but they're certainly dead by now. Uh, we have talk show hosts, we have YouTube influencers, and we have podcasters. Maybe that's our intellectual today. But if those are intellectual today, I'd, I'd go short on them. You know, I don't, <laughs> I, I wouldn't invest a lot because um, I don't think it's, uh, necessarily a good ecosystem for the forms of political futures that that, that we're looking into. Um, sorry to sort of rant a bit. Uh, we have Nick and then we have uh, Gustavo. Yeah, thank you. So one of the int really interesting things about this text uh, and your your 
uh, rant <laughs> that you just did. Uh, it made me think, so this is a little beyond the scope, but in Anti-Edifice, when they really bring out the artwork that patients that uh, Guattari has been working with, and they really will draw that work forward um, as a part of their theorizing. And that brings me to the sort of uh, stepping out of the way of speech for those who are engaged in these local struggles. And the way I kind of understand what they're trying to do here with theory and how they think about theory is that the point of the intellectual is to help sharpen those uh, struggles into uh, weapons uh, that can be used in in those battles. So it's really a refinement role. It's a, it's a way of help, uh, um, I guess, uh, a knife sharpener, so to speak, could be, could be a metaphor that we use. Um, but that's really what the theory does. It's not speaking for them. It's a way to assist in creating those weapons that are that are on the ground and are already engaged in struggle. Uh, <clears throat> this is a question for Andrew after I'm done. But what's what what is the difference in your mind between a discipline specific expert like uh, Anthony Fauci uh, versus uh, someone who's an influencer? let's say, uh, our former president. Uh, I think that would be the question. But uh, right now, what it seems as though the way that I interpreted the reading was that knowledge has changed. So the intellectual now has been, instead of the individual, now it's more of like a swarm, societal type of intellectual practice. And that seems like the technology connects us together that we can aggregate knowledge very similar to science. And I think that's where the communication media and also this type of media helps us expand intellectually. And I'm not sure if this is true, Andrew, but maybe you can comment that seems like in every generation, knowledge also evolves the brain and it evolves a certain type of capacity of a library or a dictionary of knowledge. So we have more of these virtual books in our heads or references that we can pull from. So the conversations are more sophisticated. So uh, that's my. Uh... Yeah, I'll, I'll engage this really briefly. I don't want too much for me to stand as an expert here. You know, I'm certainly no universal intellectual in this sense, perhaps not even a specific one. Um, but for the the your your last uh, remark, Gustavo, the sort of idea of evolution, I think that there is some truth in the sense of. Um, uh, the Lism others commitment to vitalism that we can see these sort of uh, notions and remarks here. But I would say, you know, for me, what I read through the Deleuze is more a Nietzschean line than let's say, you know, what Catherine Hales sees through the line. You know, if, if, if we take figures like Catherine Hales who are readers of the Deleuze and uh, broadly this sort of tradition, they, they might even take this sort of progressivist or Whiggist approach to knowledge, which she seems to be proposing, which is it sort of accumulates and it, it builds and it moves forward. But I think, you know, for me, uh, Nietzsche's line is to say that there is a sort of evolutionary framework, but it's not a Darwinian evolution. It's in fact this other evolution where we're constantly breaking down, we're undoing, we're, we're undermining. And so I think that there's something sort of dangerous in thinking that we're getting increasing mastery, let's say, over the world or a situation or something like that. Because in fact, I think that while we do have intensive investments in certain things, like let's say, you know, ice core drilling to see the very deep and long history of um, what 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 the geo history of, of the planet is. And, and by no means am I sort of downplaying that. I think there are other notions of knowledge or history that either disappear or that are incredibly devalued by that approach to knowledge and its, its sort of progress too. So I'd say that, you know, at least in the traditions of, of, of thought that I work through, it's, it's certainly not operating according to some deep accumulative uh, uh, logic of evolution. And, and in terms of just the specific expertise thing, I think that disciplines accumulate their own sort of knowledge principles over time. They sort of stand on them. And that's incredibly uh, helpful or useful for doing things that require a lot of rigorous analysis, like a you know, ice core drilling or something like that. But I will say that there's something very peculiar when I was revisiting Foucault's um, Plague City introduction to the Panopticon chapter in uh, a dissident Discipline and Punish with a, a group a few months ago, where these pre-scientific measures for uh, disease control in a 
pandemic type situation were precisely the same as the ones that are being given by public health experts right now. And so I think we might want to think that we've accumulated broad and new and innovative forms of knowledge. But I think that what's really interesting once you look to Foucault or Deleuze in particular is they're embedded within various social systems. And perhaps that the reason that, you know, plague control looks like the same uh, it does now 400 years ago is because the social conditions in some ways need to stay the same, the management of populations and that sort of thing. Whereas, you know, how much is the scientific knowledge actually leading things? It, it, in some ways, I think it's it's sort of behind the charge. And that's why we have such a confused social situation right now. But, right. you know, there are a lot of people in mind. So let's go to Ven, Josh, and then Harris. Uh, yeah, um, speaking to um, sort of your, your rant earlier, but also to um, what, what you were just saying in response to uh, Gustavo, um, the 19th century contexts and, uh, and jailing and sort of how that, that created um, a kind of a context uh, for um, a lot of the things that were being written by anarchists and Marxists and, you know, um, uh, all kinds of sort of people in, in rebellious situations in those times. Uh, I think uh, we can even turn to Foucault for, um, you know, uh, how, how Foucault talks uh, in, in, in his project about uh, speech that is kind of compelled uh, and, and, you know, sort of that, that role of uh, secular confessional that, you know, say psychiatrists have and how that's kind of generalizable. I think that at this point, um, you know, capitalism and the sort of like the, the, um, the power structures that capitalism uh, embodies or is embedded in uh, are, are totally fine with people speaking on you know uh, issues that in the 19th century you get jailed over and in part they kind of want you to speak they want they want to know what the enemy thinks uh, in, and they want to be able to uh, have it mean you know a, a footnote essentially to have it be uh, a theorizing that does not apply to practice to have it just be theorizing in the open space that just you know diffuses and then amounts to nothing and i think that 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 really is um uh, you know part of what the question here is uh when you're talking about being an intellectual today and how to uh, uh you know attend to current material conditions instead of the material conditions of the 19th century uh is to look at how uh theory is very often uh kept in its own space or when it does apply to uh events that are happening uh it's not in that way where um, you're actually going down with people who are doing the practice and doing it with them, you're st it's still an illumination from a distance, um, which is exactly what Deleuze in this, in this interview says it isn't and what it shouldn't be. And I think that that very much is what's happening is that we've been kind of, uh, you know, kind of s segmented off into this, this way of theorizing that allows us to think that we are doing something sort of more in the line of what Deleuze and Foucault are talking about, and yet it has no real impact and it doesn't really do anything with social movements so much as comment after the fact. Um, and I think, I think that is, you know, part of the answer to the question that you posed in your rant, um, is, is that we really do need to be directly engaged. So I actually just like what uh, what Ben just said made me think a little bit more. And when you look at social media, you look at the way media works in general and communication in the you know post-industrial technological age, the, the 19th century is almost completely irrelevant. Uh, there's really a demand for new theory because anything that we think of right now as radical down to this meeting, it has been completely enclosed by the greater society and not just the state, not just capitalism, not communism, it doesn't really matter but everything's been completely and totally enclosed to the extent that whatever happens within is immediately absorbed. It loses its power as a weapon. Ideas that are communicated through social media, it's irrelevant whether it's a weapon or a tool in the first place, because both of them have zero effect on the actual aggregate mass of it. It's, you know, society has just become so ossified and so held in place that to move it is a completely different type of construct. I and mean, you really can't think of the same sort of theory back then. Uh, I was thinking uh, when he was saying that as well, uh, think of the recent situation if you're in the U.S. and, uh, you know, the Chaz up in Seattle, the temporary autonomous zone, when if you actually read Hakeem Bey and think about the impact of an autonomous zone, 
the second that the media gets into it, it's gone. There's the media removes all purpose and it actually takes away that element of danger because it's no longer a threat to the broader society once it's been observed by the broader society. Uh, and that's something that I think you can really look at in, in this day and age that these antiquated ideas of say 19th century politics have nothing to do with us. And I think that really you know died in some ways with me, uh, Marcusa and, and the one dimensional man. How prescient was that? And just imagine if he could see us today everything comes true, you know, and then some even more so. Uh, it, it's a completely different sort of a situation. Um, and what I was thinking about, Daniel, when you were talking, or not Daniel, I'm sorry, Andrew, when you were talking earlier during your rant, uh, I couldn't help also thinking of, uh, you know, like Thomas Kuhn and his questioning of science and the whole concept of questioning paradigms. Whatever we consider truth today is simply a paradigm until the new one comes along and topples it off and something new after that. And we can't help, and I think this is a, this is very prominent in, in intellectual discourse and whether you want to make it a, a statement about, you know, the broader intellectual or the individual, complexity does not equal progress. Complexity does not equal a greater understanding and complexity does not equal any, you know, closer to truth. But it's so hard for us to get away with, get away from that. And as, as our society, I guess, becomes more complex I keep finding at least myself, you know, moving closer and closer to some sort of a Taoist notion that the, the truth isn't there to be perceived in the first place. Like, like really this concept that it's always going to be just beyond us. And we almost need to continue simplifying rather than making things more and more and more complex uh, because it just winds up lost, lost in the ether of the internet or whatever the latest jargon is. Anyways, I got slightly off topic, but uh, I really, really liked Ben's point and couldn't help myself. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, I sort of have a question, uh, mainly inspired by Andrew's uh, rant, um, which is pertaining to the worker struggle and the reference to Marx. And I think it's really interesting that they, they end the text, they end the conversation with this. It's saying that all of the localized forms of resistance or struggle, um, no matter how seemingly they're unrelated to the struggle with the proletariat, they all come back to it. And I think that's something really interesting and something that we might want to problematize, especially today. And there is something like this to be found in A Thousand Plateaus as well, uh, towards the end of the Apparatus of Capture um, Plateau, where they say that the, you know, everyone becoming everything, the devenir to le monde, it expresses itself in the universal figure of the proletariat. And I was thinking how we can understand this today um, and whether we can understand this without regressing to a kind of base superstructure model which they explicitly reject in a thousand plateaus, whereby all of these other social struggles are actually overdetermined by the capitalist mode of production, and therefore reaction to them questions this base. But if we move away from this model, you know, and presume a more um, what post-anarchists, for example, would call a tactical picture of different networks of oppression and power which might intersect, but might also retain a relative autonomy, then in this sense, um, might we want to problematize the notion that uh, everyone doing something, what Deleuze says, uh, in their little corner. You know, I struggle in my little corner, another group does this and theirs. Uh, we might want to problematize whether this actually connects with, the, necessarily connects with the struggle of the proletariat and uh, with the class struggle and even, you know, the potentiality of revolution. So that this is, I think, an interesting question that we might want to, to examine. Um, hello, uh, can you hear me? Um, okay, so I would like to develop more on the concept of truth. Um, I think the philosophers today are pretty important as to secure this concept because uh, it's, it's starting to decline as um, democracy and ethical relativism are on the rise. Um, so I think we have something similar to ancient Greece going on. There is a staging of the battle versus sophists um, and the philosopher, where um, I think that the influences you mentioned before um, are on the side of the sophist and everyone advocating uh, vividly on, everyone advocating for democracy and parliamentary mechanisms are also on the side of the sophist. 
So eventually, the philosopher's task is to craft a new concept of truth. Um, as you may know, after Lacan's writings, there is a pretty there is a pretty complex um, relationship between the concept of truth and the concept of knowledge. Um, I think Deleuze develops his own concept of truth when he talks about sense in his book, uh, Logic of Sense. Um, as you may also know, often Derrida and Foucault are often accused of closing the horizon of truth, like they are denying truth essentially. But I don't think that's the point. Uh, I think they leave out a certain ontological place where truth is to be situated. Um, and as uh, Harris mentioned before, I think we could uh, we could turn even to post-anarchist thinkers like Todd May or Dwanner or Saul Newman to maybe craft a new truth that has a very special relationship to knowledge. Um, as Lacan used to say, truth is always half said. There is there is not uh, only positive content in it. Excellent. So I think we're, we've we've seen a number of really strong interventions here. Um, I just want to pick up the thread of the worker struggle really quickly to try and understand perhaps why the list is making this argument and how to update it or, or ask it anew. Um, and I like the post anarchist thread because I think it may assist us in some ways here. So. I think that the reason that uh, Deleuze and Foucault of all people, Foucault who was notoriously um, sort of anti or at least mark critical of Marxists, um, used the worker as the figure at the end of Intellectuals in Power, I believe, because they still at that time think that the worker might be a figure of universality. You know, this is the great um, gambit of Marxism to think, is there a single structural position through which all or most um, identities, or at least the ones that they care about politically, all intersect? You know, and Marxists will say that it's not that we all work in the same way, but to be an oppressed person in the world of capitalism means to uh, be a wage worker, to have to buy your subsistence on the market. And the only way to acquire that subsistence is through a wage. Now, that's perhaps not even universally true in Marx's day. Probably isn't universally true in 68. Anarchists and, let's say, the strong lifestyle of the anarchist, going back, let's say, I don't know, the hobo or the tramp, or people who either do very casualized or non-work and they find other ways through, the way from dumpster diving and riding the rails today or you know, scanning or, or, or anything that might be this other way through. Perhaps that might be an alternative sort of condition. Um, but by the time we get to a thousand plateaus, for instance, they all say, you know, th they're part of this molecular revolution of the marginals of the excluded or partial people, but they're still holding hope for an intersection of struggles. And this is a bit different than let's say, uh, black feminist intersectionality. But I think that the logic is very similar, in which you know, they're trying to see what the points of unity without it ever coming together might be. But you know, this could quite quickly go into Chantal Mouffe and uh, Ernesto Laclau socialist hegemony territory in which you just sort of you know, align a chain of contradictions within a society through a social movement and altogether build a new hegemony. And that's certainly not what I think uh, DNG are proposing. Um, so the question would be, is there a universal condition today? Perhaps even we want to throw out the universal, though, you know, it goes back at least to the Greeks, which is perhaps why they want to sort of keep it. Um, but the idea is, is there a new universal that's formed? And I'd say that there is one argument, perhaps from, let's say, a left or ultra-communist perspective, that it's just dispossession. It's no longer the wage um, the wage lay, uh, uh, the, the, the wage arrangement it is, it, maybe it's still kind of the cash nexus, which is what a good Marxist would say, you know, having to, you know, gain your subsistence through some sort of, you know, 
cash monetary system through which the wage was the necessary lever for, but perhaps it's now just dispossession. And if we move it to dispossession as this universal condition that intersects various struggles, what might we get? And, you know, I would say that in my own work, this is something that I've considered in that it means that we're not building a positive identity together. This already goes through the whole work of Lewis, you know, difference in repetition in particular, in which the principle of identity that we get through a sort of German idealist or Hegelian tradition is not really what's most important here. Um, but instead, it's about a negation of our own subjectivity or position together. The only problem is the politics of that is quite messy. It means that instead of winning and gaining things together, it means often losing things together. And that's a that's a very scary proposition. But I think that the voices within Afro-pessimism in particular have argued that, you know, like that old sort of um, uh, black socialist feminist slogan goes, nobody's free until we're all free. So you need to think of from the perspective of the worst off or the weakest and I think that's already sort of latent in a lot of DNG's work. And so I think that that's a sort of provocation to take up. Um, it's already past 10. So I want to give anyone who's not had an opportunity to speak yet an opportunity to sort of put in some remarks on intellectuals in power. And then maybe we can move to the tools and weapons. But I know this is taking a while and I don't want it to be some sort of, you know, marathon session. So maybe we can limit things to maybe another half an hour. And if we feel that we need to discuss more, you know, leave that to another day. Um, so final remarks on intellectuals and power before we move on to the next reading. See, Gustavo, you have your hand up. Andrew, this is uh, directed to you. When you uh, when when you're talking about a universal identity and Marxism based his on, let's say, the worker, can we say that we can base a new universal on two uh, maybe absolutes right now? There's a physics absolute where we're coming from atoms. That's kind of a kind of a kind of a proven thousands of years of understanding of knowledge. But also there's a data or informational way of looking at who we are. Well, basically, we're dissolved into these little bits. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I think this is an interesting question in the sense that um, the way that the philosophers have taken up DNG, for instance, sometimes leads to just inserting it back into a history of metaphysics. So what is the metaphysical scheme or system? Is it grounded in something? How might there like be entities or reality? Is it a representational, let's say, a, 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 an anti-representational approach? And that could lead you to something like post elysian thinkers like uh, uh, Quentin Meassou, who, you know, picks up some of these sort of provocations to imagine a sort of post or non-Kantian approach, um, or, you know, Francois Lacroix, who uh, once again is working through theories of difference or something like that. I would say that the one thing that separates DNG from all of those is this line in A Thousand Plateaus where they say politics precedes ontology. And by that, I think that they very clearly outline the stakes for them, which is they do not want to outline a metaphysical schema because they think it has more truth or reality in it. They are doing metaphysics for a reason. So it says they might appropriate things like an atomistic approach. They, sure, they might appropriate something, you know, like recent approaches to science, which is what distinguishes it, let's say, from Heideggerians, who very, very willingly, you know, or, or some of them at least, you know, uh, say modern advancements is in how science understands the world not terribly interested in figuring those out because they don't get me to, to where I'm interested in terms of knowledge, truth, or, or thought, you know, if we want to put a big T on it. Whereas for DNG, they ruthless, ruthlessly appropriate the most modern forms of thinking in their day, as well as reclaim some forgotten or anachronistic ones in order to create a war machine to fight the things that they really care about, which is to say, international world system of capitalism and the way in which states have historically and continue to realize that contemporary system. And so I think it requires a change in perspective about sort of their approach. And so universality in, in context I was discussing was if there is to be a subject, if we're even speaking of subjects, to carry this sort of political project forward, who are they? 
can philosophical speculation or thinking help identify and, as, as someone said previously, sharpen the way in which these political projects might function to sort of assist them? Um, and not in the universal, universal intellectual approach of, let's say, a SART, which is to say, to put philosophy back on its proper footing or to allow philosophy to advance and develop itself enough to sort of carry those projects forward based purely on its sort of reality or truth value. Um, cool. I don't want to, I, I think we, we've already sort of exhausted this a bit. Hopefully that sort of clarifies the stake. And it, interestingly, I think it opens up into the Thousand Plateaus reading um, quite well. So let, let me discuss that quite briefly, just as a sort of entree. If people you know, are already quite familiar and need a drink or a coffee, this might be a good time to take it. But um, I love how the conversation naturally sort of shifted into the question of the worker and politics and power too, because um, that's going to be the ending of our reading today. And if we have enough time, Dana will help us sort of um, uh, talk through some of those bits. So Thousand Plateaus, I mean, Many of you might already know the background of a Thousand Plateaus, but a Thousand Plateaus is uh, the second out of the three major sort of uh, uh, collaborations between D and G. The first one was Anti Oedipus, which was a uh, reassessment of both psychoanalysis and Marxism in a sort of heretical way to sort of get outside both of them uh, that happened in the wake of 1968. The final contribution is much more sort of elegant and limited, but it still maintains these sort of anti-capitalist um, orientations. It's called What is Philosophy? Um, and that sort of takes them into the 90s, I guess. And their middle work together, I mean, excluding their small little Kafka book, um, their middle work together is A Thousand Plateaus, which is sort of the most you know, magisterial of the works. It progresses in a series of plateaus in which you're instructed to read the first one as an introduction, to read the rest in any order you'd like, and then finally concluded the last one as a sort of summary or summarizing fashion. It picks up some of the political threads and a little bit of the psychoanalysis that came previously, but it really pushes past those very quickly. And so what we see to a thousand plateaus, I believe, is really kind of um, understanding what they're doing with this expansive project that starts going through massive amounts of literature, biology, uh, animal science, uh, linguistics, old historical things of cultures that maybe were even Orientalist a little bit in their presentation, you know, just like, what are they doing with this wide sense of materials? So one way of sort of understanding the bit that we're reading today is it comes through what sometimes people call the nomadology, which is two plateaus that are meant to be read together. And in fact, the way they're structured implies they were at once two different plateaus and that's, or they, they were once one plateau and then somehow got sort of cut in the middle. In Guattari's journals, which in English were published as the Anti-Oedipus Papers, he remarks that Deleuze immediately after they finished Anti-Oedipus started writing the nomadology probably before they even started thinking of um, the rest of how a thousand plateaus would work. And he became obsessed with his nomads and, you know, it was published separately in a few places. Um, and so we can imagine it was sort of, Deleuze had the initial energy behind it. And he had the sort of way he wanted to, to sort of keep it together. And so, you know, Deleuze, who historically really liked Spinoza, decides to use a geometrical formulation of this sort of French rationalist tradition, you know, subverted in part through Spinoza, that he continues to sort of subvert that sort of rationalism. And so it's a series of axioms and propositions, a lot like how Spinoza's ethics is written. And this is still an open question for me of what this means, because, of course, Deleuze himself does not propose axiomatic thinking. He's actually quite critical of axiomatic thinking. Um, and he prefers instead to problematic thinking, to proceed by the problem rather than the axiom. So what exactly does it mean to have a whole two plateau segment posed in the structure of axiomatic thinking? Right. So that's, that's an open question that maybe some of the more nerdy people can, can help me figure out either now or later or in a future time. Um, and the, the top level geometrical formulation, or at least the topology of it, is quite curious. It has three points. Two points are internally connected, and they're the two poles of the state, which he goes all the way back to early comparative mythology. But in contemporary political terms, it would be that there is a liberal contract version of the state, which is to say, who believe in 
uh, an ability to eliminate coercion through mutually agreed upon contracts. Um, and he ties that to an older notion of priests and how they shuttle between the divine and the profane. And on the other side, a warrior king who wins through conquest and violence, oh, interestingly, operates at a distance. So it's to say they command rather than being, you know, at the head of the line. So it's not fleet-footed Achilles, it's Agamemnon. Um, and so we have these two poles of the state, and um, E and G say they work together in a complementary, you know, a silent handshake or a, a backroom deal and maybe a ratcheting sort of uh, a way. And anyone who's critical of a two-party system like in the United States knows precisely how those two things sort of work hand in hand most of the time. And even if one is critical of the other, in the end, they're both supportive of the state and they sort of move it forward. But then, you know, that's where maybe someone like Foucault would end. There's power and there's resistance and it's in circuit, but it's in opposition. Um, in D&G, there's then the nomad war machine, which is external. It's a third point. It has no relation between those two. So the dialectical logic, or even the way in which the dialectic functions, is purely a state form of thinking. And the war machine is an outside. It's external. And it's not the sort of like, there's no alternative, or there's no escape. It's that escape is primary. In fact, if we, uh, uh, depending on how we formulate it, the war machine maybe precedes the state or the nomad precedes the state. That's at least the account that we get in uh, anti Oedipus. So we have these two things. And so we're digging down today into looking at two different sides of this sort of three-point topology. On the side of the state, we see tools, which work according to the royal science of the state. And the other side, we see weapons, which are used by nomads in their war machine. Uh, throughout the whole chapter, or uh, through our, the portion of our reading, but then also goes broadly, it's knit into a collage of references. So it goes in a lot of different directions. You know, some of them work better than others. But I think the sort of hidden interlocutor, and it's hidden in a very funny sort of way too, in the sense that there are these block quotes that don't even have citations in some portions. And who is that that's being cited? For those of you who are new, it should be no obvious, but it's the anthropologist Pierre Clost who was himself a student of Claude Lévi-Strauss, who, um, but, you know, Lévi-Strauss was actually politically, when it comes down to it, conservative, and so they had a major falling out over this. But um, Klost studied uh, North American indigenous people, and his major sort of political claim through his work was that uh, war for First Nations and indigenous people was initially an anti-state force, that it dispersed power rather than accumulated it. And it's only until the modern state appropriates and steals the energy and the techniques and operations of war for itself that the war machine suddenly becomes a state's technology. And so for them, this notion that the state or that war is always on the outs with politics, it's always threatening to escape, it's always you know, not following orders, it's following this other completely nomadic logic. For them, it's something to be recaptured and to be appropriated for politics. Um, I'll note also that despite their sort of freewheeling style of writing, this uh, even one section of this highly structured, geometrically structured plateau has a very specific analytic logic where they say that the weapon tool continuum can be defined by five differential traits. And they propose a sort of differential logic to be able to understand it. Perhaps uh, that's something that we can talk through if you're interested in each one of those five traits. And curiously, that means that they say that weapons and tools are made up of the same stuff. In fact, perhaps they're even the same thing. And what differentiates them is not the actual physical object itself, but the assemblage that selects and activates it. So we're already seeing a sort of figure ground reversal that's absolutely uh, 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 indicative of the sort of French philosophy of science tradition that they're working on. Okay, three observations that I wanna make that I thought were sort of novel within the argument of this section. And then I'd love to just throw it out to discussion to see um, what other people made of this section and, and sort of where they wanted to take it and the weapons they see themselves um, uh, operating with. So the first is their claim just a couple pages in that 
weapons do not come from the hunter, but from the hunted. What do they mean by this and what's at stake? So they say that weapons, if they were to come from the hunter, it mean it would be a predatory tool used to exploit, let's say, but that the logic behind the hunter is predation. And they say it is not that. You know, and, and interestingly, there is a, a structuralist anthropologist history of the hunt that you can go look up and read if you want, because it was very important for classical Greek um, notions of citizenship and membership for people to go on the hunt and align themselves with hunters. And there are uh, gods and goddesses of the hunt, the Roman one being Diana. Um, and so there's all kinds of notions of hunt and hunting. And what they say is those who use weapons are not hunters. In fact, they appropriate the hunted, making it into a motor. So we get two things from that. One, that weapons take the point of view of prey, as in the hunted. So they're already aligning with the weak, the exploited, those on the uh, receiving end of exploitation and oppression and violence. And we see on the other side of it that there is a motor of the hunted. So it's not a victim theory of the hunted. And that as the hunted becomes incorporated into an assemblage and made into a weapon, it gives it a, a dynamic propulsive force of speed and all these other differential characteristics that then allow it to, let's say, combat or confront um, uh, the state but not in direct conflict, like an opposition of forces, but an evasion, uh, a superiority, an ability to, to um, outsmart cleverness, perhaps, or the exploit, like I mentioned in uh, the uh, comments. So that's one. Weapons are not the hunt. They are the point of view of the prey. Two, they have a novel approach to both affect and assemblages here. There's a lot of talk about affect, and we have like Greg here today, who you know uh, uh, has been really essential to helping us think through and develop really smart notions of affect. And so I think we have a sort of interesting sort of return to the Spinoza's heritage of an affect being a product, or at least in the Deleuzean reading, an affect being a product of an encounter, material encounter, um, but that it's not a feeling, it's something else. It's this thing we're calling a weapon. Cool. And then the other side of it, which I mentioned quite briefly, but you know, we see in Foucault, we see in some other sort of uh, thinkers in this time, that the weapon or the tool is selected. That's kind of a Darwinian logic, but we see it in some other things too. It's, uh, it's selected by the, the assemblage or in, or in more biological or ecosophical thinking by the milieu. So the milieu selects whether it's gonna be a tool or a weapon. So you need to actually look at the environment. So once, as I said, it's a figure ground reversal. Okay, second characteristic, these sort of novel approaches to affect and uh, um, assemblage. And then third, uh, at the bottom of page 400, just to feed my own project, my own reading of Deleuze, um, DNG note that a weapon undoes. It's a decoding. It is related to the void or a not doing. And so it's not, uh, building up. It's not a accumulative hegemonic type of strategy. It's not the coalescing of a social movement to get their message out and everyone's following it in the news. It's not an Occupy Wall Street in that sort of way. Or if it is, then the actual synthetic relations of the people working in the group are, let's say, a product of this larger undoing. And so I think this works back into my question of what's our new universal. And if it is, maybe it's not the fact that we're all wage workers. Maybe it's that this classic line from Marxism that the proletariat is the party of its own self-abolition. And so I think it gets us back into this abolitionist framework that I think is absolutely crucial, at least in the U.S. in, in 2020, 2021 with the George Floyd uh, insurgency. Okay, those are my readings. So some suggestions for a conversation now that we're moving to discussion. If people found it interesting, I'd love to hear what, what people think of these five different deferential traits. Um, each one of these sort of like novel proposals uh, that I, I mentioned, these three I think are good. Um, 
or we can just move into a broader conversation about where you see weapons or tools working in your own sort of practice experience cases, uh, moments, that sort of thing. Cool. So I'm gonna I'm gonna step down for a moment and, and hopefully the conversation develops. I see in line uh, Nick and then then Charlie. Yeah, thank you. Um, so that was great. Thank you so much. Um, and one of the things you said towards the end, especially about um, the void or the, the sort of unknown, um, the blank, uh, it reminded me of in Intellectuals in Power when they talk about the newspaper and the role of the newspaper and that there are these things that are known by people, but that are not known in the way that the newspaper presents it. Like the newspaper kind of presents a sort of false uh presentation of it. Um, and it reminded me of actually this ethnographic work that I came across recently about uh, repair people working on copy machines, like Xerox copy machines, and how there's this sort of way that management understands what they do, and they follow these sort of, they're supposed to follow these sort of repair manuals. Um, but actually, the way that knowledge is circulated, the way that people work is not at all in line with the way that management understands them and the work that they do and the, the circuits of communication between the repair people and sort of informal conversation. Um, so that just sort of, that way things are imagined to be done and the way things are actually done seems exactly in line with what you were just talking about. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks to you for organizing this. It's exactly what we're looking for. Um, so going back to the question of the universal and especially the slightly awkward reference to the proletariat, um, I'm wondering if we can sort of relate this to another slight problematic element in A Thousand Plateaus, which is in the sort of the chain of becoming they described, you know, ending up with like becoming all the world. As you say, you always start with becoming woman. And this reminds me of that quite a lot. And I'm wondering if we can suggest a way to kind of um, explain this, I suppose, to kind of use it, um, is that if we do think about um, this new universe as being a kind of dispossession and a kind of rejection of stable subject forms, um, when the NG talk about the work regime being inseparable from organization of development of a form, formation of a subject, that's in the text we're using if we're saying that the weapon is kind of an undoing i would suggest that we still have to be undoing from a certain point we can't have an entirely universal undoing because then we do lose the specificities of historical material conditions so we can possibly say that this focus on the proletariat is similar to the focus on becoming woman in that it is um in a way a representation or a quasi-pragmatic point from which we have to start a limit that we have to progress through that we actually have to overcome such that if we simply ignore this limit then we just simply end up reifying these power structures that we are um, actually intending to go beyond this is not just pragmatic this is actually an acknowledgement of the necessity that you're always going past certain limits certain specific limits in undoing the subject and not simply undoing it from a position of um, frankly abstract middle class whiteness That'd be my suggestion. Yeah, I think the um, the becoming woman portion, I think maybe might even need its own uh, session in the sense that there are complicated and thorny issues that that have arisen in part through how secondary commentators have worked through it, and so I wouldn't want to sort of like. Uh, indulge the, the wrong reading too too easily and too much and, and, and get on the wrong side of something that's this very substantial literature base. But I'll say that, you know, the becoming woman section is alarming not only to people who read it the first time, I think, but it's something that has been talked about uh, consistently. And so I'm going to sidestep it for now, but invite other people to perhaps talk about it. You know, it comes in this very long becoming plateau that Often people read through its notion of becoming animal, but becoming also goes through things like uh, becoming black, which once again, we might want to be like, well, you know, it's 2021. I don't know if we want to say becoming black anymore, right? Um, but there's, you're also becoming a molecule. Um, it taps back into this end of the geology plateau, which has this look crafty and horror of, 
the cosmos both flooding in, but then someone disintegrating completely into uh, the cosmos as well. There's perhaps their most lengthy discussion of drugs there, which, you know, of course, for stoners, it's been like, oh, yeah, you know, let's use lots of drugs. But I think that uh, we see it through someone like Paul Preciado's work or um, others where, like, what does it mean to actually say becoming drug? I think it means taking on the perspective of a metaphysical approach where, let's say, the elements of reality are molecules or synthesized chemicals rather than, let's say, you know, a phenomenal, phenomenological subject, certainly, you know. Um, and so the political stakes there, I think, are a little bit ambiguous and they're a little bit clear, but I really like your provocation to say, let's return to this notion of becoming. Say, why do they say becoming always has to go through what would be considered, at least deconstructively, like the minor term? It circulates with their larger sort of nomenclature that comes up in other books as well, where they're becoming minor, they're not becoming more like themselves, you know, which, you know, for many of you, it's like a totally elementary move that you knew about all along, and you, know, you don't come into yourself, you're not Michelle Obama or whatever, you know, becoming is always this sort of unwinding process. Um, but then uh, there's also being a foreigner in your own land. So it's saying, you know, losing sense of citizenship losing your entitlements to certain rights that people would appeal to, and even critiques of notions of, of rights in their otherwise less political text of, of what is philosophy. So I think we're on the right track, and um, I don't know how much I actually said in all of this, but I think, I think this, this idea of weapons are coming from the people on the weak and on, on the weak side of whatever equation of power um, starts getting us in a good direction. Uh, Charlie, it sounds like you want to sort of keep building the conversation. Yeah, so I, I don't want to I don't want to take over at all. Uh, just because we're not going into becoming women fully, I, just, I would just like to say that I, you know, I'm, I'm working in this professionally. If anyone does have any interest, because it is such a kind of problematic uh, uh, area, I sort of like to um, offer myself to to discuss this in future. Thank you. Any other people have? I mean, we can we can talk through these sort of series of of. Um, uh, differential distinctions, because I think they're all sort of, they're all kind of interesting and unique here. So why don't I sort of pull up a few um, so we can sort of address them. So the first one is direction. And so they say that the weapons direction is related to the problem. So this is already their anti-axiomatics. So the thing that a weapon does is it introduces a problem. And it doesn't seek to resolve the problem. And, you know, there might be a distribution of solutions, but it's posing a new distribution of solutions in this classic sort of what is philosophy, both inventing concepts, but also posing problems. And they uh, also say that what the state does with tools in terms of re uh, 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 direction is to try and establish either an equilibrium or an interior. Equilibrium being state, not just like a nation state, but a state as in stability. You know, the sort of, I guess, the post-cybernetic way of stating it. And the interior, you know, in the in the terms of anti-Oedipus, it's organization, organization. You know, the interior is the folding in of the outside in order to make it stable and maintain it as an organ. Everything from the evolutionary question of how organisms escaped the ocean and moved on land the internalization of water as a you know, something sustained through organs and organization. But then that goes through all of our different uh, uh, ways. How do institutions for function as organs or organs of the state? All that, okay. And then what's the direction of a weapon? Well, it counterattacks, but it doesn't counterattack by two lines in opposition, right? It would be liquidated. The state always wins. It's accumulated far more force than the nomad ever act. Ever, ever does. So what does the counterattack actually entail? Evasion or invention? It's great, I love that. Um, and the uh, invasion or the invention is different than resistance. They say resistance is actually how the state functions, right? So, uh-oh, Foucauldians might be a little frustrated or, or worried about this, right? And they say the state actually uses resistance as something to conquer, conquer or something to put to use. So either resistance is visible, it has a showdown and it wins, or resistance as something that it appropriates 
as a motor for itself. So that's what a tool does. Okay, so that's the direction. Then we have the vector. And I already went through most of this. It was that the war is not hunting, which is predation, but they relate that to gravity, almost in a celestial sort of sense, in that what tools do is they bring back a center of gravity and they put it to work. And then they say what the vector does is that it captures things as a motor, but not a motor that just sort of drives it around in a very basic sense, but that propels it outward. And takes the point of view of the horse, you know, and this where they start the sort of horse stirrup thing, which is, certainly it's not a D and G invention. It's 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 actually this big science and technology studies debate um, uh, that that goes back, you know, quite a bit. It, I guess the natural historians talk about it a little bit too. Um, and then they have the models, which is maybe if you wanted to have one crystallized version of everything that's working um, in this section, I like the models bit a lot myself. Um, and they say that it's two versions of a motor, free action versus work. And they're anti-work here. It's phenomenal. I mean, for those of us who've been you know, following anti-work politics for a long time, that's kind of great. But um, you know, it puts them kind of on the side of De Boer, the left communist, Paul Lafargue, all these, these, these people. And so then they delve again once into more of the aspects of these motors. And they say that work has what, a few different aspects. In terms of production, it always needs to restart itself. In terms of displacement, it always works on an exteriority in order to move and influence it, which is to say using your own gravity to exert influence or control other things simply by the nature that you already have gravity, you know, using your hegemonic power that you've already accumulated. Um, on the uh, free action side, what we actually get is non-punctuated space. It escapes gravity, it escapes into uh, the atmosphere where it can operate on its own. And then uh, it blasts off into outer space. Um, in terms of expenditure, work always runs out. You know, this is, I guess, just the Bataille argument, right, about, you know, restricted economies or not. But they're saying, you know, they're there for free action. But I, I suppose we can also use this in a Freudian sense as well, or Lacanian sense. You know, they're talking about attached or uh, free and indirect libido. So they're looking at detached libido here. They're, they're, they think that work is attached, or cathected libido, and that uh, free action means that it's detached, indirect libido, or I mean, a, a free libido, circulating libido, maybe even getting into the sort of Lacanian uh, polymorphous uh, perversity. So we already have sort of both a queer, Bataille, and a, a sort of post Freudian reading here. And then also this question of resistance where work works through resistance and they're reiterating once again that work is a model of the state, royal science, dialectics, because it conquers or puts things to use. It either defeats them in order to um, uh, uh, zap, sap, some, neutralize its energy, or it appropriates it in, internal that works according to its own internal logic or organs in order to propel itself forward. Okay, that's the model. That's the third differential characteristic. And then there's the fourth one, which is expression. I think this in many ways is not interesting for, for us who already got so much uh, uh, through anti-Oedipus. Um, but it's that the state invents writing. And so writing is always sort of a state technology and it sort of works through in that way. Um, and here, if we think of writing, it's not just the ability to, let's say, um, you know, communicate with others at least in anti-Oedipus, one writes because then the king can give a command that is reproduced through space uh, when their voice is no longer in immediate proximity. So it's the reproduction of the sovereign voice or the despotic voice uh, through space as well as time. Um, it's also writing in the very classic sense of counting, accounting, um, uh, demography, finances, ledgers, balance sheets, all of that. And then there's the nobad who has two characteristics here. They adorn themselves with things that might have inscriptions or writing, but it's mostly jewelry. And it's, you know, uh, someone might say it's gaudy or excessive or something like that. But in fact, it's meant to be either a magic or a charm or something to help propel the horse to move faster. Um, and it gives them a relationship to metallurgy, which here is a synonym for also working with material or the earth, so understanding the precise circumstance of their environment, their milieu or the, the uh, materials through which they work. 
And then, okay, they also use writing sometimes, but they're always adopting other writing languages. They didn't write, they didn't invent their own language themselves, which also in turn means that there's not a historical record of them except through other languages or perhaps other people. So they're anti-history, or they're at least they have an external relationship to history. And so it's always going to have an odd sort of uh, 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 interaction. Cool expression. And then the passion. And this, I think, is the more abstract point that's, that's made. But it's that the assemblage selects through the machinic phylum whether something is a tool or a weapon. And that is the affect of that assemblage selected machinically. And so they describe what that selection process, like, let's say, looks like or, or the aspects of that process. The work regime forms subject. And they use a big F when they say forms. So they mean form, no doubt, in this like deeper philosophical sense of uh, what Simon Don will call the uh, hylomorphism of assuming that matter is formless without the, ex the external imposition of, of uh, uh, pattern or form formness which is different than, let's say, the Whiteheadian or the, perhaps even a Spinoza's approach where um, patterns or value inheres within a substance or a material uh, uh, ahead of time. Or maybe it's even the patterns themselves that is the basis of something like reality. And so they say work assumes that form only comes externally, like uh, Simon Don will say, like a slave driver or something like that. And so that gives workers, that makes workers, you know, interpolation in the classical Fusarian sense. And also that gives feeling. So that's where we get feeling as opposed to affect. It's popping up within the work regime. And then what does the war machine do? It is, it is becoming passional. And that's the movement of undoing that I mentioned previously as well. So passions in this sense, you know, I, I don't think the reference is here. We might be interested in going to someone like Charles Fourier, who has this sort of very early socialist proposal of a passional politics or a passional approach to society and social planning, in which things are always sort of being overwhelmed and excessive. You know, he's the one we get the joke of like communism is a good dinner party from. But, you know, he also thought that the seas were lemonade and he's influenced everyone um, for a long time. So there's there's a lot, lot to work with there. Um, so hopefully this wasn't too boring, but I sort of parsed those five. Are there things that are sort of popping up or should we move more towards um, Dana having us take a very brief look at uh, that last paragraph uh, we talk about as group in the call today? Yes, exactly, Andrew. First of all, thank you. It was uh, amazing, your your analysis and everything uh, that you said. You're always to the point and very eloquent. Uh, maybe I can also contribute uh, to a little bit in a more um, um, practical sense, maybe, or maybe do some proposals or maybe... Uh, somehow connect the, um, this text in Mi in Mi Plateau, the Proposition uh, 7, with the um, other text. And um, yes, as I told you, I would like to to read maybe not the whole paragraph because, you know, we're also running out of time and it, we don't need to, you know, uh, stay here forever. We will have other meetings as well. Um, this last, last phrases of this, um, of this proposition, um, that is one of my uh, favorite uh, quotes, my favorite phrases. Uh, so here, here it is. Uh, there arise subterranean aerial submarine technicians who belong more or less to the world order, but who involuntarily invent and amass virtual charges of knowledge and action that are usable by others, minute but easily acquired for new assemblages. The borrowings between warfare and the military apparatus Work and free action always run in both directions for a struggle that is all the more varied. I always like to revisit this again and again, as I already told you, Andrew, many times. Uh, as for me, it clarifies many stakes of today. Uh, and also for us here, I think it connects to some of the inputs of the um, uh, discussion. Oh, great. Great, I was wondering how, how I was going to do this. Um, so yes, and also this text collides perfectly with intellectuals and power. Um, as, uh, I mean, this is a proposition for me that is connected with the sharing of the knowledge, like the disposition of these tools and these weapons. And um, it is a proposition of, on how to pierce the wall and how to cross the line or how to create a war machine. And this is why it collides perfectly with intellectuals and power. 
Um, and also there uh, in the in the previous text, maybe do this connection a little bit. Um, uh, when they talk about um, Foucault and Deleuze, talks, they talk about representation. When they say that they will ridicule representation, we said it was finished, but we failed to draw the consequences of this theoretical conversion to appreciate the theoretical fact that only those directly concerned can speak in a practical way on their own behalf. This is this is important in this um, distribution of the tools and the weapons, and this is distribution of knowledge that here in this. Um, uh, phrases that we see Deleuze and Gattari proposes. Um, so this disposition of knowledge to me in a more practical sense can lead to the shift of power that um, Mil Plateau talks about it uh, everywhere, of course, and uh, intellectuals of power as well as we saw. Uh, not in the sense that we can, um, we can find solutions to represent others, because also as Deleuze says, uh, again, in intellectuals and power, there is this indignity of speaking for others, but to join others in a common line of flight. Um, and of course, maybe here the, the could, could arise questions, the question could arise of, as to what are the weapons and what are the tools and what is this common line of flights that we can share and join and who and what. And maybe this is a, a topic for a discussion, uh, for a later discussion or for uh, another uh, readings discussion. Um, I, oh, and also where to this, uh, where, we, where we know what are the tools and what are the weapons, where do we point? Uh, where to direct this arrow of the, the quiver and uh, where should this theoretical and practical arrow point at. Um, so there are many, many issues and there are many proposals that we could discuss. I mean, practical... There are some... ...say that manage to connect the political and the artistic and the issues of power and subversion. And uh, for example, there is um, um, uh, an artist, a uh, designer, uh, Hip van Löwenstein. He has um, uh, done uh, a work, it's, uh, it's called Exclusion Mask. And it is a mask that confuses face recognition softwares while it keeps the face visible to your peers. Let's say it keeps the machine of faciality, uh, we could say. And relevant actions have been also made a, with virtual reality kits uh, used uh, for that exact same reason in the latest uh, Hong Kong riots. And also I was informed of a group of activists uh, from Portland that they have used the software to recognize policemen faces uh, last year. An action that of course is very relevant today and very fitting to the latest uh, French laws on security during demonstrations. And other groups as well, uh, between um, I can I I cannot see it very it's maybe a little small on our small screens here, but there's a great book I wanted to suggest to you not to interrupt, but um obfuscation. No, please, please. Uh, it was put out by two NYU professors. You know, the, the middle series is working through like roles and some of that other stuff. I mean, you know, it's not the most exciting portion of the book. But the first two chapters are all case studies and people using digital and technical tools to obfuscate, which they define as hiding in plain sight. So it's not completely withdrawal. It's this more evasive um, in and out sort of uh, approach. So just wanted to... Very, very interesting. You know, the, the book was uh, connecting with your background. This is why I could not see it. Um, Yes, great, and, and many other uh, many other um, practices as well, and many other cases. For example, um, we were talking before about gem space in New York, as well as Chimera Rosa in Spain. There are two um, good examples in bio art. Chimera Rosa is a lab that uh, uh, researches and experiments on identity, technology, body, gen space, as well as a bi biotechnology lab, and accessible and open to all. And they both facilitate seminars among other things in biotechnology that are accessible for all, regardless their education uh, status. Um, and also some sound works as well towards the direction of um, socially engaged sound art uh, and projects that I know of in Athens, like Twist Club, Twix Club, for example, working with communities, with public space, and how to highlight voices of excluded communities inside this um, internal third worlds of capitalism, as Adolescent Guattari mentioned in other parts of Mil Plateau. 
Um, and for me, these examples seem to coincide with what uh, Foucault was saying as well in Intellectuals in Power, that if the fight is directed against power, then all those on whom power is exercised to their detriment or who find it intolerable can begin the struggle on their own terrain and on the basis of the proper activity or passivity, he says. Um, now, okay, I think I, I talked too much. Maybe I should uh, wrap it up. But to wrap it up, and since we are so close to the text today, as of course it is fitting also for a reading group, um, I would like to, uh, to return to Deleuze maybe, um, agreeing with him. And when he, he was saying in Intellectuals of Power once more, uh, that since we are unable to approach all, all the forms in which power is exercised and applied without revealing its diffuse character, we are necessarily led to the desire to blow it up completely. And um, I really like this phrase. I think it's also <laughs> radical again. I, don't I see know a I hand up already and, and maybe... If maybe we want to look at the text a little bit, see if anyone had any comments on particular words or lines or concepts that are coming out in this paragraph or maybe even this section in particular, because I think it's it's so great, Jane, and it's, it's precisely what we need to be looking at right now. Um, I ben, think I saw your hand. Yeah. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I just wanted to say that uh, sort of a through line from both uh, what Dana's just been going over here um, with the the sort of um, the borrowings between warfare and the military app apparatus, uh, things running in both directions, like as this sort of paragraph highlights, I think it, it does tie back to um, something that you had said, Andrew, earlier, um, uh, you know, uh, referencing uh, them talking about uh, elsewhere, like how the political comes before the ontological, uh, and it ties right into uh, lines of flight and and sort of becoming uh, as a uh, becoming in their project as a sort of ontological framework for um, abolishing subjectivity or at least taking what we understand as the forces of subjectification and you know. Uh, fighting back against them and taking power into our own hands, um, you know, to some extent. And I think that that, that really speaks to this. Um, and I, one of the things that, that I think about from, uh, from the, the previous reading um, of Intellectuals in Power uh, is uh, Foucault talking about how, you know, the, the difficulty um, of finding adequate forms of struggle being the result of the fact that we continue to ignore the problem of power and talking about how uh, you know power is not in the hands of those who govern uh, and there's so many kind of uh, uh, you know local sources of power you know I, I, I'll try and find the, the uh, yeah where he says each struggle develops around a particular source of power um, and I think that the forces of subjectification, uh, you know, like that, that struggle, uh, as well as the struggle against um, oppression, in particular oppression, where they have the monopoly on violence and things like that, um, that's something that, you know, has a, a fairly, you know, ancient pedigree even, you know, you can go back to the 16th century with Etienne de la Boitier and the discourse of, of, of voluntary servitude, um, where he says, you know, um, uh, he who thus domineers over you has only two eyes, only two hands, only one body, um, no more than is possessed by the least man among the infinite numbers dwelling in your cities. He has indeed nothing more than the power that you confer upon him to destroy you. Where is he acquired enough eyes to spy upon you if you do not provide them yourselves? How can he have so many arms to beat you with if he does not borrow them from you? The feet that trample down your cities, where does he get them uh, if they are not your own? Uh, that, that kind of a... a, 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 a characterization of power that is talking about a king, you know, obviously it doesn't apply as well today, <clears throat> but I think that seed is something that you can still uh, follow a trajectory through uh, up to uh, what Deleuze and Guattari are talking about here. Um, and it makes me think a lot um, of the, uh, the late um, indigenous anarchist Aragorn uh, who, in one of his texts talks about uh, basically that, uh, you know, we have to understand how power actually operates. Uh, and he, he, he says in, in a piece, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, I think it's called, uh, Now is the Time and Yet We Wait. 
He says, uh, what's next then? If there are no castle walls because domination has found a way to succeed without necessarily materializing, then our project no longer looks like a siege. If virtualization has become part and parcel of the dominance matrix, then single points of attack are no longer effective. There is no letter bomb large enough, uh, which speaks to what Dana was saying about how powerful that sort of ending piece uh, from Deleuze in the, in the interview was. And uh, he goes on to say, the simple answer is that we have to be patient. We have to have an engaged patience that is incomprehensible to the lethargy of the revolutionary left. Our role should not be to lay and wait for some mark to come stumbling along because that is never going to happen. Instead, we must have total engagement in the social and political processes around us. Nothing should escape our attention. This could look like, and it's not limited to attending church, especially politically active churches, going to shareholder meetings, attending city council, toasters, elk lodges, civic organizations, and even leftist meetings. The idea is not that our efforts should be particularly supportive or even destructive to these groups, although pushing the boundary in both directions should be part of the process, but to understand how it is that modern uh, acculturated civil society works. What does a social group look like and how does it react to the kind of stimulus that can be brought to bear? If you play the game, how easy is it to integrate into an organizational form? To what extent do these forms accrue power, negligence, and momentum? We need more information. And I think, to me, that speaks a lot to, to these questions of, you know, we have to have that engaged, observant patience that doesn't just sit back and doesn't just sort of wait for some, you know, almost messianic uh, revolutionary moment to occur, uh, but to be actively engaged with processes at the local level, like where you actually live, um, and in particular, as Andrew highlighted uh, earlier, to look to the people who are the most marginalized, who are the most um, you know, uh, you know, our homeless populations, those who are impoverished, um, people who are in sort of racially marginalized categories, and in particular speaking from my perspective as a settler, um, you know, it, it's, you know, indigenous struggles are, are so crucial both to the struggle to do something to put some brakes on the sort of inevitability of the climate crises that are coming, um, and, you know, and capitalism itself, which, you know, colonialism's accumulation was sort of the foundation for capitalism. So I think, um, you know, these are all things that, that, that link together, uh, and that, that free flow in both directions of, uh, you know, work and tool or, uh, 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 weapons and tools and between work and free action, you know, I think that that is something that, to look at that, we need to be actively engaged in all of these processes, and in particular, actively engaged um, where people who are the most marginalized are involved. And that's kind of like where it's kind of where my mind went over the course of sort of uh, dealing with uh, uh, this this reading. Van, thank you. Somebody asked in the chat if you could uh, maybe share uh, the link of what you uh, read. That would be uh, great, because also some of us. Um, are not uh, native English speakers, and uh, maybe they would like to take some more time on it if it's possible. Uh, Harris, you're next. Thank you. Um, thank you, Van, and thank you, Donna. Really wonderful stuff. Um, what sprung to mind, uh, to my mind, in response to one of Donna's questions, um, where does the arrow fly to? You know, um, the weapons. Where do we direct them? And when you mentioned this this image, you know, the arrow of the quiver, where is it directed? What immediately sprung to mind is the image that, uh, well, Im image in quotation marks, of course, uh, that the losing Atari gave about thought without an image, about uh, nomad thought in a thousand plateaus. And what they mentioned is an arrow um, flying at full speed, but without someone having um, fired it within the image and without a destination. So can we think of that? Can we think of an arrow in the air, but without imagining where it's going and where it's coming from? Um, and that's what immediately sprung to my mind. And I think uh, that the political implications of this uh, thought without an image, of this image without an image, would be to, to do politics without any teleology and even to do politics without much intention. So the, uh, in my mind, this could go um, in two ways. First of all, um, perhaps something that might be closer to what uh, I, I imagine Andrew would like in terms of a, a destruction without uh, a specific end, without uh, an envisioned um, other, which would follow this destruction. So an insurrection, which by definition would not set up in itself new forms. Of course, at some point it would, but the question is, we'll deal with that when we get there. So we start with 
destruction and abolition in its pure form, no teleology, no specific direction, just this thing in, in the arrow in mid air, and conversely, in a more affirm affirmationist kind of direction, and perhaps closer to the loses Nietzscheanism and the kind of positivity that flows through all of his work, creation, again, without teleology. So creation of new forms of life, of new, even you know, artistic creation or political creation, creation of institutions, but without a purpose. You know, not this happening for the revolution, but this happening in itself. Again, the hour in mid-flight. And what happens after, it's, uh, you know, it's, um, it's a matter of the future, a matter of the interactions and the events which will be sparked by this flight. And of course, these two, in my mind, are not antithetical. They could very well occur at the same time and even complement each other, um, so long as the, the, this sort of arrow is preserved. Also wonderful, and I think you know it's hard to upstage this. And we've already gone on for two hours. You know, I think we were initially planning like forty-five to sixty minutes or something. So, you all have been so generous with, you, with your time already. Um, Maybe if people have any sort of like final concluding remarks to put them in the um, the chat so we can make sure we we grab them. And otherwise, um, well, you know, when when we were talking yesterday, Dane and I were thinking like, what comes next? You know, we initially thought a uh, session in a couple weeks on the subject. Um, maybe that famous sort of like page or two in anti Oedipus about voluntary servitude and the Russian moment in which people start desiring their own uh, oppression, um, combined with a couple pages on social subjection and machinic enslavement from A Thousand Plateaus, because that goes in so many different directions, like the, the recent neo Spinozist political work means it goes uh, returning to this question of uh, desire and where does desire sort of uh, work and operate, you know, so many different ways. Um, but then I'm just trying to catalog some things that came up today, you know, it feels like there could be a couple other directions. We could bring up the question of becoming. You know, I think there's that huge becoming plateau. We'd want to sort of select a portion of it, but maybe work through some of those. Um, I know that there's just a portion of the Becoming Plateau that I think would be great for it. Um, any other suggestions on on where people would like to see the readings go? You know, it, it doesn't have to be limited to Deleuze. I think that was just sort of the initial kernel and we can get more contemporary. I think getting older would not be the way to go, but um, other people? Maybe we'll just maybe we'll, we'll just do the subject um, in a couple weeks and then reassess from there those those portions. But if people have other ideas, drop them in the chat, and we'll talk afterward. And um, you know, maybe after a couple sessions, this will be even more robust. And we'll want to add in like a chat room or an ongoing email list or something like that. I don't know, but you know, don't want to jump the gun and and put in too much stuff uh, right here in front. So thank you everybody for your time. I'm going to stop recording now.